Good afternoon, everyone. I wanted to thank you all for coming out this rainy afternoon to the Office of Disease Prevention, Medicine, Mind the Gap lecture given by Thomas Leviste. The Mind the Gap lecture series explores a wide range of issues at the intersection of research, evidence, and clinical practice, especially areas in which conventional wisdom may lead us astray. Today, as part of the lecture, a lecture series, Dr. Levis will discuss the state of efforts to explain race disparities in health and why biologic and genetic approaches, healthcare access, and socioeconomic status have all failed to explain race disparities in health. The results from a study being conducted at the Hopkins Center for Health Disparities Solutions, directed by Dr. Leviste, show social factors seem to be the primary reason for health disparities. Dr. Thomas Leviste is a professor, author, and public speaker. He is the director of the Hopkins Center for Health Disparity Solution and Will William C. and Nancy F. Richardson Professor in Health Policy at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Dr. Leviste has been featured in Newsweek, Newsday, Black Enterprise, and the Baltimore Sun. He has also been seen on CNN, National Public Radio, and other national media outlets. On behalf of the Office of Disease Prevention, the Office of Behavioral and Social Science Research, and the Health Disparities Interest Group of the National Cancer Institute, please join me in welcoming Dr. Thomas Leviste. Well, thank you. In 2006, there were over 286,000 deaths to African Americans nationwide. There were 400, I mean 44,000 Asian deaths nationwide. The African American crude, crude death rate was 1330, that's per 100,000. The Asian death, 14, I mean 440, uh, 14. So what if African Americans had the death rate that Asians have? That is, the death rate of the group with the lowest death rate in the United States. There would have been 115,000 African American deaths that year. That's 170,000 fewer deaths. 59% of all deaths that year could be considered excess mortality if African Americans and Asians had the same death rate. That's 14,000 deaths per month, 3,200 deaths per week, 468 deaths per day, 20 deaths per hour, one death every three minutes. In the time it took me to do that, there was at least one excess death in the United States to an African American. This is the essence of what health disparities are about, health disparities by race and ethnicity. Deaths that occur at a higher rate, younger ages, based on characteristics of individuals that should not necessarily determine how long an individual lives. This is the core of what this is about. And we've approached it, for the most part, from the standpoint of social justice. In fact, it is wrong and is inconsistent with the values of our society to have differential quality of life, rates of morbidity and rates of mortality based on race or ethnicity. But there's also a, social, a, a utilitarian argument that there is a cost to the economy, a cost to our society that goes beyond social justice and that cost can be calculated and we've done this in a report that we released in 2009 where we calculated and estimated the burden to our economy of having people be sicker than they should be in terms of direct medical care costs, costs in terms of lost productivity, and also costs associated with premature deaths. Now much of what I've just said I think is not new to most of you here. We know that we have substantial differences in health outcomes based on race and ethnicity. 
But I want to ask you this question. Can you imagine our society without racial or ethnic disparities? Think about that for a moment. I ask this question often, and I've asked this to many different audiences. And when I ask you to do that, some ideas pop into your heads, as it would in any audience. Now, I know you're a unique audience, but you're probably all unique in your own, in the same way. We're all unique. But when I ask people this question, several ideas pop into people's heads. And they're the thoughts that, um, uh, that the racial disparities are really about genetics, biological differences between racial and ethnic groups, that disparities are about socioeconomic status. It's not really race. It's really SES, because there's more poverty among racial and ethnic minority groups, right? So even if that was true, why would that be acceptable? Think about that, how in our society it's acceptable that SES be a predictor of health. Or that it's not really a matter of race, it's really access to health care. This is really a health care issue. So I wanted, I wanted to talk about each of these possible explanations. I want to talk a bit about where I think the research is and should be going in this area. And, um, See what you think. Okay. I can imagine uh, a society without health disparities because there was a time when I didn't know they existed. This was many years ago now, um, uh, sadly, many, many years ago when I was working on my dissertation. I was working on a dissertation in sociology, of all things, political sociology, unaware that there were these differences in health. And as I sought, wrote my dissertation, I was looking for ways of measuring um, quality of life of communities, which is the outcome that I was interested in. And if any of you here have written, have written a dissertation, you'll know what I mean when I talk about the isolation, boredom, and tedium of writing a dissertation. I was looking for something to do. Actually, I was procrastinating, frankly. <laughs> so I went out one day and took a walk in downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. Now, if you've been to Ann Arbor, uh, Ann Arbor Michigan, you know that it was a pretty short walk. Right? So I'm walking around downtown Ann Arbor, and I find myself at a used bookstore. So I'm, I'm looking for a book to read, any book that did not have a bibliography in it, right? just anything that was not an academic book. And I find myself in the clearance section. So now, I'm in the clearance section of a used bookstore, right? So it tells you something about my economic status. Because that's what I could afford. So for, on the 50 cent rack, I find this book. And I have to remember, this is a book about the Titanic. And to show you just how much I wanted something to read that wasn't academic, I start thumbing through this book. Now, think about this now. I know how the story ends, right? The ship goes down, right? So there's no surprises here. But even that is preferable to reading another journal article at that point. I start thumbing through this book, and I come across this page, which let me know just how far gone I was towards just being an academic. I couldn't help myself. It was just what I was. I come across this page that has, is talking about who survived the Titanic. I said, wow, that's new. I thought the ship went down, everybody died. That was the end of the story. I had no idea that people survived. Remember, this was before the movie came out, okay? <laughs> Years before the movie came out. <laughs> so I'm reading this data on who survived, and I was so far gone that I had to calculate the death rates. Yeah, I know, I know. But I was fascinated by what I found. What I found is that the class of ticket on that ship that night determined your survival. That if you were a first class ticketed woman, 97% woman survived. And three of the four women that died gave up their seats voluntarily. If you were a second class ticketed woman, about 84% survived. And third class, about 55% survived. So even in this unusual case, where the entire ship went down, your social class determined your survival. By the way, if you were a male, I mean, that was an even more powerful predictor of survival. If you were male, you had almost no shot right, of making it. So who you are mattered, even in the most unusual of circumstances. But the magnitude of the disparity is really what's fascinating. And why it happens, how it plays out. 
you see there were only 53 percent, uh, only, there was only enough life force space to accommodate 53 percent of the people on board that night. So on the, on the evening of April 15, 1911, at 11.40 at p.m. in the North Atlantic, space on a life raft was a scarce resource. And when it comes to divvying up scarce resources, who you are determines who gets what. It seems to me the Titanic is a, an apt um, analogy for the U.S. healthcare system, right? Big, expensive system, handing out unequal quality of care, destined to hit an iceberg and sink. And if you think, okay, that was 1911, that was 100 years ago, this could never happen today. Well, this is the U.S. Air airliner that landed on the Hudson River back in uh, 19, uh, 2009. I did not Photoshop this except to put in <laughs> first class and coach class. So when you ask why pay for the first class ticket, I want you to think about this picture. <laughs> right. a, set of health, a set of policy decisions were made that produced this, by the way just to get off on another tangent. There was a decision made somewhere that we wouldn't require enough life raft space to accommodate everyone on the airliner, right? There was a policy decision made by the manufacturer of the airliner not to voluntarily put enough life raft, life raft space on the airliner, right? There was a set of policy decisions, corporate policy as well as governmental policy, which leads to this, and that's another conversation for another time. But just so you know, that scarce resources are divided up in part based on who gets access, who has the power, who has the ability to garner those resources. So health disparities came on the national scene in a big way in 2002 with the publication of Unequal Treatment, a report by the Institute of Medicine which, which compiled the evidence that there were differences in quality of care received among people that had health insurance. And I want to stress that, that the book is not a book about health disparities. It's a book about disparities in the quality of care received by people that had health insurance, showed up in the healthcare system, got seen, but didn't have the same quality health care. Right? Now, it's done a good job, this report, of, of placing the issue on the front burner of the nation's health policy agenda. And it, stay, it has stayed there, frankly, much longer than I thought it would. This is a quote from a policymaker who stated that a key test for any new system is the ability to provide access to quality care for the poorest and sickest among us, and the elimination of health disparities must be a critical goal. No American can be left behind. This was a quote from former Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich, who has become quite knowledgeable about health care issues and health disparities specifically. Another leading policymaker makes this statement, African American males die sooner than other males do, which means the system is inherently unfair to a certain group of people, and that needs to be fixed. Anybody know who, who that is? Anybody? Obama. President Obama. No. President this was former President George Bush, who made this statement in 2005, not in the context of announcing a new program to fixed the problem, he was in fact making the argument that social because of the higher death rate among African Americans, that African Americans should support his effort to privatize Social Security because then their benefits would be inheritable to their, to their families. So political considerations aside, there clearly is awareness at the highest levels of government that we've got a problem of health disparities in this nation. So we're past the awareness phase, I think. At the core is this slide. This is a slide showing age-adjusted uh, mortality by race and gender from 2003. I used to update this slide every year, but I stopped in 2003 because it became pointless because it's the same slide every year. It's the same pattern. The rate has been slowly declining for everyone, but the differential is exactly the same. So this is the core of what we're talking about, this differential. Now, health care disparities 
I think are nicely illustrated by this chart. This is a report done on data from the uh, Medicare program. And um, I would just bring your attention to the um, limb amputations, as I think one of the, the great best illustrations. These are procedures that you do not want. These are procedures that occur because of long-term uh, inadequate access, utilization, and quality of care received by patients. And as you can see, in each of these cases, we have substantially higher rates of utilization among African Americans. For example, limb amputations among diabetics. Limb amputation should not happen. It only happens because of long-term um, mismanagement or poor management of diabetes symptoms. And each of these would be in that category. This is a study by some guy named Leviste where we uh, went into three hospitals in Baltimore, and, and I guess I owe it to my employer to point out that Johns Hopkins Hospital was not one of the hospitals in this study. But this was a study where we, we pulled um, records for um, five years for all patients at these hospitals that had a um, diagnosis that would suggest they could be a candidate for cardiac catheterization, right? uh, an invasive procedure which uh, is used to diagnose uh, heart disease. We identified patients who, based on their medical records, should have received a referral for catheterization. And as we see, that even when we, re we review these records and we see that there's a disparity here where a uh, little more than 80% of white patients got the referral, which is already low, too low, because it should have been 100%. But when you look at the African American rates, even lower, less than 60% of African American patients who should have been referred were actually referred. Now, what's interesting about this is that these were all insured patients seen at the same hospitals during the same time period, and this is a procedure for which the hospital would be reimbursed. So if there were an economic incentive, that incentive would be on the side of providing more care, not less. And even in that context, we find a disparity. Another study that I like, this one, I, I really like this one because it's uh, done in the VA system. And um, this one is looking at revascularization. And uh, this is among patients, all of whom were appropriate uh, candidates to receive revascularization. And we see a substantial disparity. About 50% of white patients that should have received revascularization did, and less than 30% of African Americans did. Now, these are all patients in the same system with, that are on VA, which means that this is a covered procedure. And the physicians are all on salary. So there's no economic incentive on either side to either provide care or not. And we see that we have a huge quality problem, but we also have a disparity in quality problem. So this is what health disparities are really all about. That even within the context of having access, having insurance, accessing the care, we still find these differences. And I would say that in spite of the fact that much activity has occurred over the last 10 or 15 years around health disparities, that much of what we have done and are doing about health disparities will fail. And the reason that I believe it will fail is because of the incorrect diagnosis. Now, if a patient shows up in your treatment room, before doing anything, you would stop to try to make sure you have the diagnosis right. But what we do in health disparities is that we throw resources at it. We can argue about whether there are adequate resources, but we throw resources at it without first stopping to make the diagnosis. Now, there's a chance that we'll randomly hit upon the right solution, but I think our chances are better if we stop first and figure out why do we have these differences across racial and ethnic groups. So I want to address three of the most popular explanations that I receive about this. And the first one I want to talk about is the idea that there are genetic or biological differences. So is anyone here not familiar with the case of Bidil? Anyone not know what Bidil is about? Okay, so I'll, I'll give a very kind of Reader's Digest overview of what Bidil is all about. Okay. So Bidil is a drug that is used to treat congestive heart failure, which is a debilitating disease that afflicts about a half million people per year in the United States. It's an expensive disease because those patients utilize a lot of healthcare resources, show up in the emergency room often. And um, Bidil was 
was developed initially in the late uh, 70s, early 80s, during a time when there were a number of um, new, new um, medications coming on the market, calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, coming on the market to, treat, to treat um, heart disease. Well, Bidel is a combination drug, a combination of two generic drugs, and some physicians began using this drug, these, these, these uh, generics, in combination with the beta blockers and other treatments of the day, and they were experientially finding good results. So one group of physicians got the idea of actually doing a clinical trial to see, to do, you know, do a research to see, can we actually document benefit to this new therapy of com this combination of drugs? And they found that there was a benefit, that there was a, uh, that the patients that were on this combination therapy were having better outcomes, as, as uh, the experience suggested. This article was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and uh, it became quickly adopted as, a, as a, sta a standard of care that a lot of people began to use. So someone had the idea of, well, what if we put these two generic drugs together into one pill and market that as a separate, as a new drug? So they did this, and they were able to get a methods patent to do, to, uh, um, to, to, uh, to do this. And when they went to commercialization, it was not approved by the FDA. Now, why wasn't it approved? It wasn't approved because that study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine was not done to the standards necessary for it to progress to commercialization. So now they're stuck, right? The monopoly is running out. There's not enough time to do a new clinical trial that would be the FDA standards, and you know, they're going to lose on this opportunity. So they go back to the original data, and they begin to do analysis or reanalysis of the data. And they do analysis by race. And now let me stop here and make, and make this point, and especially for the researchers in the room. Let's say that we had a drug, and we administered this drug to black patients and white patients. Right? And we found that, and these are not the, exact, the correct numbers. This is just a, an example. Let's say that we found that 80% of the black patients that had this drug benefited from it, and 70% of the white patients benefited. Right? That'd be pretty good, right? Those are really good uh, rates of, of, of success. But that 10 percentage point difference would most assuredly be a significant difference. Right? We would get a significant odds ratio, we'd publish a, an article, and we would title it something like drug more effective in blacks, because we got this significant race effect. Now think about that statement for a moment. That's the way we talk among ourselves as researchers. The drug is more effective in black. There was that article that showed the significant race effect, so it's more effective in black. Is the drug in that example more effective in blacks? Or was it effective for more blacks? Think about that for a moment. Everyone that got the drug, if you benefited, you benefited. You didn't benefit more if you were black than the white patient that benefited. You either benefited or you did not benefit. So there's no magnitude of levels of benefit. A larger percentage of African Americans benefited, but they did not benefit more than the whites. But the way that we talk about it as scientists is we say, the drug is more effective in blacks when it's not. And when that kind of terminology uh, gets out of the scientific community where we understand the caveats and people start to make policy decisions and people start talking about this informally, that kind of terminology does harm. And I think that is a lot of what happened with this Bidel case. So the drug is more effective in blacks. And if you ask physicians, many physicians practicing now, they will say the drug is more effective in blacks, when in reality, it was effective for a larger percentage of blacks. It's a very subtle but important point, and it's something that we do often, and I think it misleads the public and even misleads our, each, ourselves. And this was the case with Bidel. So when they found that the drug was effective in a larger percentage of black patients in their study than white patients, they then went back to FDA and said, we'd like you to give us a new methods patent, but this time the patent should be for use only in blacks. 
and FDA gives them the patent. Largely with the support of advocacy groups, including the Association of Black Cardiologists, NAACP, the Congressional Black Caucus, who helped all helped to advocate for the passage of the, for this approval. So now they go back and they do a new clinical trial, this time on only black patients. And what do you think they found? They found that Baidu was effective because Baidu is effective. It's effective whether the patients are black or white or Asian or any other ethnic group, the drug is effective. So when they did this new clinical trial, this time to FDA standards, they find that the drug is effective and FDA in 2005 approves Baidu for use in black patients. So let me ask you, who do you prescribe Baidu to? Do you prescribe Baidil to this African-American gentleman who has one Scottish grandparent, one Irish grandparent, and two Jamaican grandparents? This is Colin Powell. Do you prescribe Baidil to this African-American gentleman who has two Kenyan grandparents and two white American grandparents? This is President Obama. Do you prescribe Baidil to this African-American gentleman, okay? One Chinese grandparent, one Thai grandparent, one uh, Native American and white grandparent, and one African American and white grandparent. This is Tiger Woods. Or what about this guy? Looks like a black guy to me, right? But of course, this is VJ Singh, who is from Fiji and not African American at all. The folly of race is that we think that because we can look at skin color, that we understand what we, know, we need to know about the individual's genome in order for us to make decisions about what's happening under the skin. And that, as we see in the case of Baidil, even scientists who are operating after the Human Genome Project had already released this report, still came to the conclusion in 2005 that there is a scientifically valid reason to approve a drug to be used in only one race group. In 2005, not 1905, not 1805. The illusion of race can confuse the best of us. The next explanation that I hear for disparities, racial and ethnic disparities, that I think will lead us astray is the idea that race differences are really about socioeconomic status. It's really income, it's really education, it's really access to care, it's really these other social factors that are out of the control of the healthcare system and it's not really about the individuals, it's about the fact that you have larger proportions of people that are racial and ethnic minority in, in these uh, disadvantaged statuses, and therefore that's really the problem. So let me just quickly try to dispel that. This is just some analysis that I did of the health interview survey, looking at a variety of outcomes and finding persistent disparities by race regardless of level of education. This one on infant mortality, this actually comes from NCHS data where they're looking at infant mortality rates. Um, and I just wanted to point out that the infant mortality rate of uh, African-American college graduates is higher than the rate for white women with less than a high school education. So clearly we have a disparity by socioeconomic status and by race and that each independently is an issue that we need to be addressing. SES as well as racial and ethnic disparities. Now, a brief message to researchers, because some of you are probably saying, well, you know, we deal with that by using multivariate analysis, right, especially those of you that are epidemiologists. So what I want to do is to address that issue and, and, and talk to you a bit. So this is for the researchers in the room in particular. Now I'm going to do a set of analysis for you which will be very familiar because it's the kind of thing that we do every day. And we read articles using this kind of technology all the time, 
and we never question it. And I, let me also say, before I won't move any further, that while I am standing here before you railing ab about uh, certain sins of people doing health disparities research, I am not without blame. So if you go on the PubMed and you punch my name in, you may find me committing some of the same sins that I am now here talking about. So the point is not that you can't um, criticize the sin, but rather we should all repent, <laughs> go forward, and sin no more. Okay? So don't feel bad if you've committed these sins because some of you probably have. Now I'm going to do an analysis of the National Health Interview Survey, so big national data set that everyone here has heard of. And I'm going to do a simple analysis of the adults over age 40, and I'm going to use only three variables. Race, meaning black or white. Income level, which I've categorized into three groups, less than 20,000, 20 to 75,000, or above 75,000. And the outcome variable that we'll look at will be having at least one ADL, or activity of daily living limitation. So I think we can all agree that I've set the bar pretty low. Just one ADL limitation. I probably could never even get that paper published, could I? One ADL limitation, and we're only going to look at the relationship between race and having an ADL limitation after controlling for income levels. So, so in our Biostat 101 class, we would be taught that the first thing we should do is look at the relationship between race and having an ADL limitation, and that's what we've done here. We have an odds ratio of 1.46. The confidence interval tells us that this is a significant effect, and we would conclude that in the bivariate analysis, blacks have a 46% greater odds of having an ADL limitation compared to whites. Am I right so far? You, you, can, you can talk, it's okay. <laughs> so the next thing we would do, and I guess this would be a Biostat 201, I don't know. We would then look at the relationship between income and having an ADL limitation. So here we have the odds ratios are declining as income increases. I'm, and, this, and the confidence interval is again showing us that this is a significant effect. So we would say that, as we would expect, that as income increases, the likelihood or the odds of having an ADL limitation decreases. So next, what are we going to do? Put income and race together in one model to do our multivariate model and see whether it's income or race that's producing this outcome. So here we go. The analysis shows us that the race effect is no longer significant, statistically significant, right? The confidence interval says it's not significant. The income effect, however, persists. So we would conclude that it's, there is no race difference in ADL limitation. It's really a matter of income levels, right? And we would publish this article, and we would get a promotion, and all would be right with the world, right? <laughs> Wrong, except that we would have now added false information to the research literature, because if we had taken the next step of just simply arraying the data by race and income and looking within each cell, we would learn a few very interesting things. First of all, that in the lowest income uh, uh, group, less than $20,000, that there is a race difference where African Americans have a higher rate of ADL, uh, of having one ADL limitation. And in the highest income group, the African American rate for age for $75,000 or more is being calculated on the basis of only eight events. So your numerator, your numerator is eight. How confident are you about calculating a rate based on eight events? So in the National Health Interview Sur Survey, with over 30,000 cases, we can't do a simple multivariate model of regression analysis to answer a very simple question without having these limitations. Now, I want you to think for a second now about the article that you just read that had a sample size of 500 people in a telephone survey or something and looked at uh, race differences and something and ask yourself how many empty cells or in inadequately populated cells might there be in that analysis. Of course, not in your papers, of course, but some paper you read. So we've got problems. 
Another issue is this, I think illustrated nicely here. This is a picture of a high school in the Baltimore metropolitan area. And as I'm taking this picture, I'm standing outside the, the campus, and we see trees and grass. As I drive onto the campus, we see more grass, more trees, and off in the distance, we start to see some of the buildings where the classrooms are held. And as I drive around to the side of the campus, this is the gymnasium where the volleyball, basketball, and gymnastics team performs at this high school in the Baltimore metropolitan area. This is another high school in the Baltimore metropolitan area. This is an upper middle class suburb of Baltimore. I'm taking this picture at the entrance of the building. There's a lawn here as well and trees. Of course, the building is clearly visible to the street. As I drive around to the back of the building, here's the soccer team going off for afternoon practice on a wide open field with no bleachers for uh, fans to watch the baseball game there. And as I come around to the back of the building, here are the portable classrooms. Because in this upper middle class suburb, suburban high school, the building is not adequate to meet all of the needs of the number of students that go to that school. And finally, here is a high school in the Baltimore metropolitan area. So we've got no lawn here, but if you look closely, I think there are some weeds in the cracks there. And there is a, high, and there's a tree. And my point of showing you these pictures is this, that the graduates of these institutions are all recorded in your data set as high school graduate. And do you think that perhaps there are meaningful qualitative differences among the graduates of these institutions? Do you think that perhaps there are race differences in who goes to which school? And do you think that Perhaps when we do our multivariate model and we adjust for education and think that we've now equalized the sample, which allows us to make race comparisons, do you think that perhaps we're not capturing some form, some level of social stratification that's not being captured by that variable in your data set that simply says high school graduate? These are the underlying problems with much of the research that we do in health disparities, much of the quantitative research in particular, using national data. We don't account for the fact that there are systematic inequalities in the variables that we rely on to try to equalize the sample. We try to equalize the sample with research methods in the analysis phase rather than in design. And it's always going to be inadequate to do it at that point. Now, another aspect of this is the fact that while we all live together in the same country, we experience the country differently. And because of that, there are differences that are patterned by race and ethnicity in exposure to risk. These are some pictures of corner stores in Baltimore. This one actually happens to be just a couple of blocks from my office. And the risk environments that we live in are quite different. So that when we look at national statistics and we calculate race rates based on race and ethnicity, to what extent are we capturing differences in the risk environments that people live in? This is my favorite one here. I, again, I did not Photoshop this. L&M Liquors, they sell beer, wine, and medicine. <laughs> I just love that one because of the truth in advertising. And of course, the, 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 the medicine that they sell is, of course, the elixir. <laughs> The elixir for the ills of poverty, malt liquor. And, and if you don't know what it means, come see me after, what malt liquor is, come see me after uh, the lecture and I'll explain that to you. Of course, there was a study that we did a few years back where we looked at the location of these corner stores in Baltimore and arrayed them by race and income to see what types of neighborhoods tended to be targeted for, by these kinds of stores. And as you can see, it's predominantly low income in African American communities as you might expect. Now, one more story before we get into the, the research part of this. Now, I should point out that I'm gonna, I'm gonna give us, tell you a, a, a brief story about something that happened. And, and it's about an article that I was asked to review for a journal, a real fancy journal. I mean, if I told you the name, you'd all be impressed. Now, it was blind review, so I don't know who the author is. The author may be in the room right now. 
If you are, you're not going to want to claim this one. If you just remain quiet, I won't know and no one will know, so don't out yourself. Okay? Now, I get this article to review. The title of it is something like Race Differences in Firearm Use, use Among Black and White Adolescent Males. You see titles like that, right? Something like that. And unfortunately for this author, they used data from the state of Maryland. And unfortunately, they sent the article to someone who lives in Maryland to review the article. So I'm reading this article, and I see that all the black males are from Baltimore City, and the white males are from Garrett and Allegheny County. Now, I'm sure I don't have to tell this audience what that means, right? The black males are shooting pretty much pistols. The white males are shooting long guns or rifles. The white males are shooting at, I don't know, wildebeest or pheasant or whatever they shoot out in Allegheny County. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know what they shoot out there. And the black males are shooting at, right? Now, you know, I know a lot of whiz-bang statistical trickery to pretty much get the data to confess anything pretty much that I would like it to confess. But I just don't know a statistical trick that makes this a comparison of race differences in, in firearm use. This is a difference of one type of hunting culture versus a different type of hunting culture, perhaps. <laughs> it's a study of urban versus rural populations, perhaps. But it's not a study of race differences. In order for us to do that, we'd have to get some black males living in Garrett and Allegheny County and some white males living in Baltimore. And we look at their, hang and, uh, their firearm use, and then we can make some comments about what they're doing. So that's an extreme example. It's an extreme example, but it illustrates a problem that is usually more subtle in health disparities research. And that is that we don't account for the fact that the United States is a highly racially segregated society. In fact, tomorrow, tomorrow we're going to be releasing a report on looking at the relationship between segregation and health in the United States coming out of the new census data. And I can, at least, uh, I'm not supposed to tell you the results, but I can give you a, a preview which suggests that there is a very strong relationship as there have been in previous census data. And that relationship consists, con continues, and not only has it persisted, but it's actually gotten even stronger in this census. We don't account for this segregation. We look at national statistics and national rates. We make policy based on the national rates, but we are not accounting for the fact that people are living in very different risk environments. And because they live in these different risk environments, we don't know to what extent the disparities that we see in national reports are really something about race, or is it really about racism, or is it really about who lives in what neighborhood, and what determines which neighborhood you live in. We need to start moving to that uh, phase of research if we're going to understand what really is the etiology of health disparities and move us towards the correct diagnosis and solutions. So in order for us to do this, we need to start finding environments where people are living together with similar risk exposures, with similar socioeconomic status, and see if we can then find the disparities, what is the magnitude of those disparities, and do they still even exist once you have that environment. And this is the study that we're, we're pursuing at the Center for Health Disparity Solutions at Johns Hopkins. We've identified 425 census tracts around the country that meet the criteria that we established to indicate racially integrated census tracts of 35% African American and 35% white living in the same census tract with uh, relatively small differences at best in income and education levels. And we asked the question, what is the nature of race disparities between black and white Americans when we don't have to contend with race differences in socioeconomic status or race differences that are the result of living in different risk environments. When we live in the same healthcare market, when they're exposed to the same health risk or protective factors, do you still find the same disparities? And just a little bit about the logic of how we do the study, we identify these census tracts. We go in and we do a, a, a set of uh, interviews on the adults. Largely, the interviews are replicating um, um, questionnaires from the National Health Interview Survey, MEPS, and um, NHANES. 
which allows us to conduct similar analysis in the national data and then also in our data set to see if the disparities are the same and to what degrees they differ. And so I'm going to just give you the results of a, uh, some of the analysis that we've been doing um, and where we are at this point in the study. So first, uh, we identified these 425 sit, uh, census tracts around the country. Mostly they were located in the mid-Atlantic region or in the west, in California, a few, and, um, but mostly in the mid-Atlantic. Um, and fortunately for us, several of them were in, in Maryland and in Baltimore. And uh, our, the first site that we went to was actually two census tracts, two contiguous census tracts in Baltimore, which we put together to create one study site. And the, uh, these are the results from, from that first analysis. So this is from the 2000 census. This is the income level of, uh, in that community. As you can see, it's a very low income community, but there are essentially no race differences in, in income levels. Poverty is, is also very much equal, dramatically higher than poverty rates nationally, but um, no substantial race differences in uh, rates of poverty. Here is educational status based on the census. As you can see, the, the black and white residents are also very equal in terms of educational levels. And the distribution uh, by gender is also very equal. So it's, it's best you're going to find in a naturally occurring environment. I think this is pretty close to getting uh, equalized populations. So the stage, uh, it was a study of two census tracts. We did about a 40-minute interview. They were uh, conducted in person. Blood pressure was our, uh, one of our major outcomes, and we did uh, blood pressure measurements on them. And uh, we were successful at interviewing 42% of the adults living in those two census tracts. We, we did not sample. It was our intent to, to uh, try to get a census of the entire census tract. We were able to get 42% over a 12-week field period. So I think that was pretty good. So first, uh, I'll just talk about the degree to which we represented the community. So here we're just comparing our uh, results, um, some of the demographics from the sample compared to the, what the census found. Um, our study was, the, our data collection was done in 2003, so it was about three years after the census. Um, actually, four years. The census actually was out there in 1999. Um, but uh, as you can see, we ha are um, uh, slightly overrepresented for um, African Americans, but not substantially so. This is probably my favorite slide ever in my career. I think we did a pretty good job of reflecting the income levels in our sample compared to the census. Education levels, um, pretty good. We're a little overrepresented here and there. But we can account for that in the analysis. And also distribution by gender, also uh, pretty reflective in this, of the sample and the census tract. So I think our sample is pretty representative of the community that we studied. So again, we're doing, we do analysis in the national study, in the national data set, such as Health Interview Survey or um, NHANES, MAPS. And then we, re, we do the same model with the same controls, and we measure the variables the same way as the national data sets, which allow us, as best we can, to do comparative analysis. So, um, so here I'm plotting um, odds ratios. And, um, and I'll show you the actual tables in a moment so you can look through them if you want to. But this is just sort of reflecting the odds ratios, the adjusted odds ratios. So in red we have, uh, uh, think of that as the analysis that you would have for, um, well, this would be whites. And then we're plotting the odds ratio for uh, blacks in the National Health Interview Survey for uh, diabetes. 61% greater odds of being diabetic from the health interview survey, compared, and that's what, we know, that's what we normally find. That's the result that we'd find in the health interview survey if we do this analysis. When we do the same analysis, the same multivariate model, we get 7% greater odds, which was not significantly different. So there was essentially no race difference in diabetes in that community. Here's a similar type of analysis done for obesity among women. And in this analysis, we get a 87% uh, greater odds of being, ob for being obese if you're a woman nationally. And the, the, uh, this was uh, also a National Health Interview Survey. In uh, our sample, it's 25% greater odds, which was also not significant because of the confidence intervals were relatively wide there. And then this is for hypertension. 
So you've got 101% greater odds of being hypertensive from, the, uh, from NHANES. And in our sample, it was 42%, which, was, which, was, which is significant, significant race difference still. So here we do still find a race disparity in hypertension, but it's greatly reduced compared to what you find in the uh, national surveys. So just so you want, uh, here are the uh, actual odds ratios. This is an actually a series of models. I think I actually have the, um, no, I don't have all the covariates, but this is a summary of the, um, of the results of, uh, of, uh, of fully adjusted models that we conducted in the national survey and compared to what we found in our racially integrated communities. And you can see substantial differences, substantially smaller disparities or not significant disparities found in the integrated community. So what this suggests to us is that when people live in a similar risk environment, that we find more similar outcomes across race groups then we find differences. That much of the disparities, we think, by race and ethnicity are disparities that are the result of exposures to risk scapes that place individuals at increased risk. That the disparities are not really just about socioeconomic status, they're not really about genetic differences or biological differences, but these differences that we see nationally are the result of living in unhealthy environments. Now let me say a few things about the community that we study. There is no physician in private practice in these two census tracts. There is no pharmacy. There is no grocery store. There are no chain stores of any type, not even fast food. There are mom and pop fish fries. There are check cashing places, pawn shops, and corner stores selling alcohol, lottery tickets, and cigarettes. It wasn't until I got, we got this data and it occurred to me how many times when I would be walking down the street in this community, I'd be asked for a cigarette. I mean, it, it, it became so normative after a while that it didn't even register anymore, people asking me for cigarettes. So you think with an income, median income of about $25,000, how do you afford to purchase cigarettes? Do you know what a pack of cigarettes cost? Do you know? Those of us in public health, we should know. We should always know what, what's going on. Pack of cigarettes, depending upon what brand you, you purchase and whether or not you get a sale and which state you're in, can range anywhere from about $4 a pack if you're really lucky and find a really great sale of a generic cigarette, up to 7 or even $8 per pack. So how do you afford to do that on $25,000? Well, because many of these stores sell what they call Lucy's individual cigarettes, which are much cheaper to purchase um, well, they're much more expensive per cigarette to purchase that way, but of course they're more affordable. So you have a tremendous amount of smoking. In fact, the smoking rates were about three times the national rates in this community. Like virtually every adult had at least at one point in their life been a smoker. So, um, so you have a classic food desert with no, virtually no medical care infrastructure in this community. And when you place anyone in an environment like this, they're going to have poor health outcomes. I should point out to you that the disparities that we're finding, we're finding that the disparities have been minimized or eliminated. But they're not minimized or eliminated because the black rate goes down. They're minimized or eliminated because the white rate is much higher than you'd find nationally. And they're equal. They're equally unhealthy in this environment that is destined to produce unhealthy people. Did you have a question? Good question. No, well, we did adjust for age and everything. The age distribution was similar to the national distribution, and what you find nationally is that African Americans are younger than whites, and we found the same thing in, this, in our community as well. I should also say this community was not, a, this is not a community in transition. This is not a case of whites moving into a community to regentify. This is a community that's been racially integrated at least since the middle of the 20th century during the uh, World War II when people began to move to, 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 the, um, to the cities for manufacturing jobs. Whites, the, 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 uh, the migration pattern was mostly blacks moved up from the south, mostly from North Carolina into Baltimore. Whites moved from West Virginia into Baltimore. They, they converged in the manufacturing uh, uh, base of the city, which was in the southwestern part of the city. 
which is where this community is, and this community has been racially integrated since that time and has remained so. Yes. Yeah, we're, we, the question was, have we looked at uh, similarly integrated communities with higher incomes? We are working on that. We're working on getting the uh, resources to go into a high income community and do that, as well as um, outside of urban areas, can we, you know, rural and also um, suburban communities. And there we might find some differences there, because in, in a, I think in a higher income community, you may have more social mobility, so you may have more, a larger proportion of, uh, of people, in particular probably the African Americans who are first generation um, affluent, so that they maybe had a childhood uh, in poverty or a lower income, were upwardly mobile, and they may carry with them some of the endowment of their childhood in poverty. Or, that's one, other, that's one possibility, another possibility is that they actually may be more healthy because maybe there's a selection on health for who, gets to, who can be so upwardly mobile. That's one of the questions that we're really interested in, in looking at. Um, that is the, the trajectories. Yes? Yeah, we, you mean in this sample or in the higher income sample? We actually asked quite a lot of questions about, about um, racism, stress, and social. There's, there's actually a lot in there. We haven't, we haven't used all that data yet. But yes, we do find that. But what we find here, interestingly, is that you have a very high proportion of whites who report being the victim of racism and discrimination and, and have that stressor as well. And actually, we have a, one paper that we're working on now looking at racism and health among whites in, in this urban environment, where we're finding that racism is, is a predictor of negative health outcomes in that population as well. So we actually, yeah, we actually have a lot of uh, data on that. So I'm not sure how this goes now. Do I just take questions from here? <laughs> yes. 425 tracks. Well, well the, the census tracts, so they're pretty small geographic units. We'd have to be able to get the, um, so you'd have to be able to get the, the geographic identifiers, which are usually not publicly available from the national samples. Um, you could, um, I don't know that you could calculate like an infant mortality rate for a census tract. But, Uh, if you can get permission to right. the linkage, the, the, ultimately the, the uh, uh, NCHS has every single uh, birth record, all the information. Right. Okay, so they, they obviously release just a sort of de-identified data set. Right. But it might be a way of doing a special analysis in which you, know, you get the information from just those. Right. The hypothesis, right? You know, survey information, some of the key kinds of other variables that people are looking at, you know, in terms of you know, some really very key kinds of things like mortality, or who knows, maybe even if possible, there's not enough hospitalization data out there. But anyway, it's just a suggestion that maybe there's huh. some other ways of, ex of exploiting what it looks to me to be a very uh, interesting uh, set of, uh, of census tracks because it's really segregated. <laughs> Right. Well, there were about 168,000 census tracts. We found 425 that met, met the criteria. So it, it could be, you know, one approach we had, we had thought about doing more of a national, you know, maybe a national telephone survey within these census tracts, or even face-to-face -face on a sample of those tracts, 
rather than going from community to community, I mean, it's another, it's another approach. I, I do like going into the community, though, because when you do it that way, you're able to, um, able to equalize as much as possible. They're living in the same environment, not similar environment. They're exposed to the same toxins. They're exposed to the same healthcare marketplace. They're ex exposed to the same crime rates. They're exposed to the in environment in, uh, in, a, in a way that you, if you did a national sample, you would have to try to measure all of those things to be able to capture that. And that's part of what I think is, is the is the problem with some of the health disparities research that we can't always measure all of these social determinants. Yes? Um, can I ask to please say your question at the microphone? We're video casting and we can't hear the questions. I'm sorry. <laughs> I could repeat the questions if that would be more efficient. So my question, my question is, the census tracts that you do have, the 400 some odd census tracts, do you yet have information on how many of those would be in the higher income bracket so you know if it's even feasible to look at that aspect of things? Yeah, it is feasible. I don't, I don't have in my memory exactly how, how many of them are, but we identified uh, several census tracts also in Maryland, uh, several of them in Prince George's County as a matter of fact, that met the criteria and, and that's where we're hoping to do our next data collection. So, so the, those tracks do exist, those high income tracks do exist, mostly in suburban areas though. Okay, another maybe more substantive question than my last. Um, this is really obviously very, very interesting findings, um, but in terms of thinking about implementation, sort of the implications do, of where do we go from here, what are the next steps for researchers, those in the policy realm, sort of the best next steps, either what is being done and preferably if you could touch upon what should be done with this type of information, what are the key audiences that you foresee and what are some of the things folks at places like the NIH can do to positively impact these uh, disproportionately affected communities? Well, there's a softball question. Give me a grant. No, I'm just kidding. That, that was a joke. That was a, that was a joke. That was a joke. That was a joke. Well, um, so I did actually intend to, to end with some talk about policy implications. But um, I mean, essentially, you can deal with social determinants of health by either we, I mean, so we have decided culturally to, to, devi to define social status in a way that we create social hierarchies. Well, we can undefine that, right? We can make, uh, instead of making race an important determinant of where you are placed in the social hierarchy, we can not do that, right? That's the, that would be the simplistic response. Um, failing at that, we can look to intervene. That is, are there ways that we can infuse protective characteristics into communities that are um, high risk? In other words, through policy, can we do more to reduce risk exposure in certain communities? Can we do more to make sure that we have adequate resources so that we don't have food deserts, so that we don't have medical deserts, so that we don't have places that produce sick people by virtue of their characteristics? Um, we can uh, also, and probably a less effective approach, is to help people to become more resilient and have better coping strategies so that they can manage living in environments like that. And I would say the fourth approach would be to, through use of medical care, wait until people get sick and then provide even more medical resources to try to make them better. So those are the four approaches we can take um, to, to addressing social determinants. As far as the research, where it should go, I mean, I know where, where we're going in the research is we're going to continue to do this work. Um, we want to do even more to begin to integrate the social, behavioral, and biological sciences together and to look at multiple levels of, of, um, of factors and how that ultimately plays out in, in looking at disparities within this kind of a context. We like to go into different communities, different characteristics, you know, urban versus rural, higher income communities, different part, regions of the country, and see if the results that we're getting here hold up. We're able to look at different types of communities. 
And I also think that looking at social trajectories are very important. That we do have, now it, is also, it is true that in, in, in the United States, for the most part, the social class that you are born into will be the same social class that you will live your entire life in. Most people, if they're born poor, they will live poor and die poor. Most people, if they're born affluent, they will live affluent and die affluent. But there is social mobility. There are people who are able to change social status across their lifespan. I, we'd like to look at that and see to what extent social mobility may be, uh, how social mobility may be interacting with race to affect disparities. Yes. In the beginning, you showed slides that had, you know, Tiger Woods, Colin Powell, and Obama. And for the Baidu, um, it was sort of, in your opinion, incorrect to consider people of different um, ethnic backgrounds all one race. Um, and then later in other studies, I just see that, um, you know, there was black and white listed. Um, you know, it seems to me that people would probably fill out questionnaires the, you know, the three men that you listed would probably all check the same box even though they come from different backgrounds. Um, and, in, and in my experience, even at NIH, we have a problem in our systems where, you know, one computer system, uh, the CRIS system, only has certain, you know, boxes to check. There is not a Hispanic box. There is not an other box. People that seem to come from Hispanic backgrounds check white, black, other mixed race, but there isn't, um, you know, a, a consistent way to treat them. There was not an option for people that were, um, you know, uh, Indian. So some Indian people checked, um, or people who seemed to be of Indian uh, background checked. Other, some checked Asian, um, you know, the Asian box. How can we, as researchers, find a system that you know, adequately addresses these sort of more nuanced issues mm -hmm. and uh, have it be consistent so that everybody shows up in your study, in our study, and in all the other studies in an appropriate manner. Okay. Well, first let me say that human variation does not conform to categories. Yes. And that that's the first problem. We're trying to take human variation and we're trying to put them into categories. Now, there's a large percentage of people that fit comfortably into the categories but there is a large percentage of people that does not fit into these categories. And the idea is that we're, the problem is we're taking this spectrum, this, this inherently continuous category, uh, variable, and we're trying to make it into finite fin categories. So having said that, if you're going to do that, Office of Management and Budget in 1997 reissued Directive 15, which, uh, uh, establishes federal policy on how data ought to be collected on race and ethnicity. Now, Directive 15 is not perfect. It certainly wasn't perfect when it was first issued in 77. And the 97 uh, um, revision was an improvement, but it's still not perfect. But it does create a policy. Most people, most researchers that I know pretty much follow Directive 15, um, actually frankly stunned to know that NIH does not follow Directive 15. I think that's interesting. I'm glad we got that on, well, on tape. Well, you know, I, it was more, <laughs> you know, it's, you know it's, it wasn't something that we reported, I, I don't believe, in the results of our study, but yeah. it was for some form that had to be filled out. And right. I was, you know, in the, and it's also, we have one system, Chris, one system, ATV, um, and they're not exactly the same, and it wasn't even listed the same within two systems. I believe there was an option yeah. um, in some, in the one system to choose Hispanic in the other system had not been updated, that there was, a, it was an option to do that. So, I don't know that so, it, it was for, you know, data collection in terms of publishing results, but it was for some kind of continuing review. Right. So, I mean, I'm going to answer this. If we're going to continue to categorize people into race groups, if we're going to continue to acknowledge race as if it were a reality, then we ought to do it in a systematic and consistent way. And I, you know, I think we have the policy, Directive 15, which is, I think, um, so it's, it's kind of where it is at this point. Directive 15. Yeah, from the Office of Management and Budget. Okay, thank and, you. I'll look that uh, up. Yeah. So let me stress that it's not it's not perfect. There are there are issues with it, but it at least creates a benchmark, and I would think all all data systems should be using that. 
question about, I know that a lot of GIS researchers struggle with um, how to capture segregation uh, in census tracts and sort of the best that we usually have is the census tract itself. And I was wondering if you had more success um, in your sort of anecdotally in your experience telling whether or not within these, these 425 tracts uh -huh. how segregated they are uh -huh. and whether or not like that segregation plays into maybe some of the outcomes yeah. you still see that are, that are uh, you know, different. We did do that, yes. So, we, so within census tracts you have block groups, census block groups which are smaller. And then what we did was we divided the block groups even further into what we, among ourselves, refer to as many hoods, many neighborhoods. So we created very small geographic areas that were, where they were about, well, the, the, there were eight block, census block groups in the t across the two tracks. And then we created, um, I think it was nine mini hoods within the block groups. So we're talking about pretty much a, a, a city block. And we had data on the city block. And then even within that, we also had a smaller geographic area, area which, which was the street segment. So just your street between the two blocks you live in. So we captured data at each of those geographic areas, which allowed us to have extremely detailed data on segregation within the, the community. And there is some. I mean, there, they were, there were people are living next to each other. But there was a, a tendency overall for whites to live to the uh, southeastern segment of the census tracts and the blacks living more to the northwestern segment. But there was a tr tremendous amount of integration. The analysis that we did where we tried to look at whether that variable, variable was predictive didn't, didn't pan out to show anything. So it, didn't, it seemed that within a, we were talking about a three square mile area. So this is a very small geographic area. We did all of this data collection on foot. We were able to just walk the community and collect the data. So when in, in, um, so we tried to look at segregation even within this small area, and it didn't, didn't appear to, do, to uh, be predictive of anything that we've looked at so far, at least. Thank you. Um, can you comment on uh, another potentially ecological variable, income uh, distributional inequality? And I'd, I'd like your views on the overall effects, and if you think there are effects of this factor in different groups. And also, can the Gini index or something that's as good as that be measured in a census tract level? Well, you could do a Gini coefficient in the census tract. Yeah, I think you could do that in any geographic area. You could do that. Um, we, I, maybe we'll catch you after the lecture because we are having trouble getting I, such data. Yeah, I think it'd be, you'd have to do it in a, data, a data collection, I would think, to be able to have enough cases. Oh, that's so hard. <laughs> Yeah, so I think you could do it. I mean, that's what it would take. You could probably do it in our data, actually. Um, my sense is, though, there's not a lot of variation, income variation, in our sample. So it's a pretty uniformly low-income area. Um, there, there was a, a small segment to the <laughs> northern part where you had some higher-income people there, but uh, they're certainly not driving the statistics. I'm interested in your views nationally. I'm not sure whether I read okay. a comment in the New York Times from you about uh, income distribution inequality, but I think it's an important issue, and I'd like to know what you think about it, how um, it plays out in terms of health care and morbidity and mortality, um, unless that's not within your purview. Well, I mean, income, in income um, inequality, it, 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 I think that um, well, there are several ways we can go with that. So. But one of, one of the, I think, more important uh, aspects of it is that income is tied to employment and access to health insurance is tied to employment. So that, that um, there's certainly one pathway, I think, through where, where you have this inequality. When you, look at when you look at international rankings of health outcomes, the United States compared to other industrialized societies, we find that typically the United States, uh, we have health outcomes that are not as good as you would expect, given the size of our economy. We have the biggest economy in, well, frankly, in world history, the biggest economy that's ever existed. But we don't have the proportionate health outcomes that you might expect. And I think that's largely because of the income inequality. Because the statistics, you have the income uh, being controlled by an increasingly smaller percentage of the total population. Then you have the health statistics being a reflection of everyone. So that when you average people out to make these national rates, you have 
rates that are reflecting the lower income people as well. Other societies where you have more income inequality, you probably have less variation in, in health outcomes across the society. Um, so you probably have smaller standard errors and, and the income, uh, the health statistics is probably a better reflection of the overall society than what we have in the United States. So I think in income inequality greatly complicates our ability to do that sort of cross-national comparison because, because of that. This question sort of speaks to what you're addressing now, and thank you so much for the data that you've presented. It's been insightful. As, well, considering history, a lot of affluent African Americans now are, like you said, first generation affluents. They come from lower SDS, um, typically. So as affluence increases in minority communities, as opportunities increase, as education increases, how do you think that might impact these health disparities that we commonly associate with race, say five to 10 years from now, as you have more second generation minority students who are college and professionally trained mm -hmm. um, or who move into higher SES, or even when you look at suburban communities where minority populations in majority are black and white are living in more similar SES type of uh, areas, how do you think that might impact these disparities that we're commonly looking at? I think it'll, it'll impact it in, in several different ways. For one, you're going to have bifurcation within the black community, so you're going to have um, uh, those who've been able to be upwardly mobile economically, and they're going to do better than those who were left behind. And you're going to have greater concentration of poverty among those who are left behind, which is, is part of what we're going to re release in that report tomorrow. But then when you compare the, the upperly mobile blacks to their white counterparts, you still, I think, are going to find disparities that exist because you still have, first of all, you have the, the, the so, stress of social mobility and, and how that endowment of uh, childhood and poverty may be impacting their, their outcomes. But also, you're going to still have um, exposure to racism and uh, discrimination and other stressors that are going to be having a differential impact. So I think that uh, the increasing uh, um, uh, size of the black middle class is going to have a positive effect, of course, on overall health, but it, it's going to be somewhat muted, I think. Thank you. Oh. I, was, I was struck by your comment when you said that um, most people who are born, most people stay in the um, class into which they were born. Okay. Um, so, and I'm just wondering how education impacts that. So, if someone is born in um, a poor class or a lower class and they have an educational opportunity, does that mean that they tend to stay in that class or they tend to move oh. out of that? Or just how does impact? No. How does education play into that? Well, education is usually the pathway out of of, of lower socioeconomic status. So, those that are able to take advantage of educational opportunities and change their their social class status, those are the ones that make it out of poverty. And I think we're going to find a lot of people like that when we go to Prince George's County. We're going to find people who were able to become upwardly mobile by using education as the pathway out. So the, the, the fact is, though, that most people, if you are, are living in a low-income environment, you're going to, uh, let's just say, less proficient schools in, the, in these in, um, urban environments, low-income environments, are not going to be upwardly mobile because the schools typically are not doing a good job of, of producing that. We have a high school graduation rate in my city of Baltimore, about 35 percent for black males. So the majority of black males in Baltimore City are not getting high school educations and are not upwardly mobile by definition. And I don't think that's unusual. I think most major cities have similar statistics. So. Um, it's those that are able to get those educational opportunities, those that are able to be upwardly mobile. Usually it's through education that that happens, and they're able to move up uh, into a different social class. But in this country, and this is not even a race issue, this is really for all Americans, most people do not change social class. Whatever class you're born into typically is the social class you'll, you'll, you'll remain in. When we go into college campuses and we meet students, you know, students often find it hard to believe that because they themselves may be upwardly mobile and all their friends are, 
but that's because college is where all the upwardly mobile people come together into one place. So their perception is that more people are like that. But in the reality, you left many more people behind in the old neighborhood than you brought with you into college. So while social mobility is part of the American ethos, this idea that through merit and hard work we can pull ourselves up by the bootstraps, the, the evidence clearly shows that that is the minority of people in this country who are able to do that. Am I depressing you? <laughs> I know, this is the, the nature of, of what I do. I depress people. So um, I think we're out of questions. Do we have any more questions for Dr. Leviste? Well, I'd like to thank you for coming. Um, I encourage everyone to go to consensus.nih.gov slash mind the gap. We've got a couple of uh, mind the gap lectures coming up in March. There will be many more. Um, if you're interested in joining our listserv out at the registration table, you can drop your business card or sign in um, for the registration table. And thank you again. Thank you.